Thank you to Joel, uh, who is our the CSLP's inclusion chair for hosting this, getting this all together with uh, both Caitlin and Kelsey today. For those of you who may not be familiar with CSLP, the Collaborative Summer Library Program, that is the program that it actually allows all of us public libraries, libraries for the blind and print disabled um, across the United States, as well as territories to provide uh, summer reading programs. It does, you know, our theme for 2021, Tales and Tales, the images, the manuals, other ideas, PSAs, all of that stuff is through CSLP. Um, so that's just a very tiny bit of background on CSLP. If you want to learn more about CSLP, you can actually go to their website, CSLPreads dot org. Of course, they're on Facebook, YouTube, um, Pinterest as well. Very good resource to have for summer reading. So I'm going to get started by introducing both of our presenters today. Um, the And I'm doing this actually backwards. Um, Caitlin Hodges, who is going to present uh, second, is no stranger to working with people with disabilities as she has been low vision her entire life. Caitlin is currently the Disability Services Librarian at the Virginia Beach Public Library, a sub-regional library of the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled. Before working at Virginia Beach Public Library, Caitlin was a reader advisory librarian for the South Carolina Talking Book Services for five years. Last year, Caitlin was announced the 2019 ALA Emerging Leader. So she will be doing a presentation after um, Kelsey's here. And Kelsey, our first um, her first presenter is currently uh, the Branch Children's Librarian at Harris County Public Library, and she has a lot of experience in planning empathic programs. So, Kelsey, if you want to go ahead and do a little more introduction on yourself, and I will mute and stop my video. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I hope everyone can hear me and see me well. Um, uh, my name is Kelsey Dunkel, and I am a children's program librarian in the Harris County Public Library System. My branch is the Clear Lake County Freeman Library in Clear Lake, Texas, which is actually basically Houston. Um, if anyone's from Houston, you know that Houston is very, very large, and we have a number of branches throughout the whole system. And um, we have ones ranging from central Houston to north, which is in the woodlands. We have all the way to Katy. We have some in the southwest side. And um, mine is in Clear Lake. So a little bit about me. Um, I've worked at the Clear Lake branch for about a year and a half now. And my first real project was to create a, a inclusive and exclusive um, special needs program within our branch. Um, and hey Kelsey, could yes. you try um, to turn off your video? I think with the yeah. bandwidth, it might be making your voice crackle a bit. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Can you hear me still? Yeah, I'm going to have you just keep going and then I'll stop you if there's any issues. Yeah, yeah no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, again, my, uh, my branch is in Clear Lake County. Uh, Freeman Library in Houston, Texas. And uh, for a year and a half, I've been working at the branch and my first major project was to create a, a special needs program. And it ended up being a, a sensory program. And I found that that was one of the easiest and quickest ways to start a special needs program, a youth accessibility program. Um, but a little bit more personal note, my brother, uh, my younger brother has high functioning autism. And so I grew up having to go to therapy sessions um, and living with someone who had needs that the community that we lived in uh, was strove to meet for him. And so it was a very interesting youth experience. Um, but other than that, in the professional realm, I have worked with kids with disabilities for a number of years. Um, within the school system and now in the public library system. So it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful job. And I love working with, 
with them and the families. And uh, I've learned a few things in terms of programming that is gonna be my topic today. So uh, Joel, if you could do the next slide. Um, so within the Harris County Public Library System in Houston right now, we have different things that we're doing to specifically target Kelsey, we, we couldn't hear you just a yes. second ago. Oh, I'm having, looks like I'm having internet trouble, it says. Um, I think you were at probably the beginning of that slide. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to just maybe talk a little bit slower. I, I don't know if it's my bandwidth or maybe I'm just having a little, a low connection. Um, but so at the, at the beginning, I was saying that our Harris County Public Library System has a variety of things that they do to target that community. Um, and one of the first things that they do that we try to do is have an actual uh, program. So we have the sensory story times that are either exclusive or exclusive throughout the system. And specifically mine is the special star story time that's at my branch. And I will talk a little bit about that a little later. Um, but then other than that, we have monthly awareness celebrations or highlights, whether within the branch or uh, through our social media in the COVID world. Um, we have ASL story times. Uh, we have team programs that involve team volunteers, um, team celebrations. Um, we have STEM programming and we have services upon request. So that generally targets technology. So we make sure that we have accessibility equipment available to anyone who needs it. Um, and in that regard, we're trying to make that a lot more easy to access. So we're in the midst of creating a part of our website that makes it easily accessible for, for our patrons to apply for audiobooks or braille books or to have a personal ASL interpreter at their branch. Um, so it's all about making sure the community has a way to ask for those services if they don't feel like they are receiving them. Um, okay, Joel, next slide, please. Um, okay, so why? Why do you have these types of programming? Um, I think there's a variety of reasons. And one example that I've found was that a lot of the patrons I asked, would you be interested in a story time directed to your child? Would you enjoy a accessible program or a special needs program that targets a specific community such as your child or um, whatnot? And their response has always been, yes, um, I do. Um, I sometimes feel like I am a, um, a problem if I go to a regular story time that we have day to day. Um, and they say, I, my child needs certain things that they may not have. For example, my children that have autism or anything that has um, sensory issue, that they have any sort of sensory sensibility, uh, sensitivities, they say that their child cannot handle the noise or the, the amount of children that are in the room. Because generally speaking, our our story times are about 60, can have 60 people in one room. Um, and a lot of children with autism cannot handle that, the loud noises or the emotions. Um, specifically, my brother could not. So he could never attend those types of events um, when we were growing up. So I think it's important to connect with your community and it may surprise you that every branch is different, every library system is different, and there may or may not be a level of um, special needs or accessibility needs members in your community that you think. But really, I think sometimes we miss out on them because they're not coming to the library. Um, they're either um, wary to do so, or they don't know that there are services available. And I think that it's our job to make sure that we reach those members. Um, and I think that one of the easy ways I found that our community did need these types of programming um, was I would go to the schools 
And since I'm being, I'm a children's librarian, I went to my nearest few schools and found classrooms full of children with special needs, accessibility needs. And I realized that if those children are there and I don't see them at the library, maybe they either don't know or they don't feel comfortable coming. So that is one of the reasons why I do it. Um, but there are always a variety of, of very beneficial reasons why we do. Um, collaboration with schools, like I said, schools, I, especially right now, I think a lot of teachers and special need teachers and accessibility teachers need help and they need either materials or they need program ideas or they just need an extra hand. And I think that we have a, a huge part to play with that. Participation within the community. Obviously, we need to reach out to those members of the community that may or may not be, um, uh, may not know we're even there. Um, outreach with outside organizations. Uh, we, that's a huge potential for future uh, um, programming and activities and things that can help the community. Um, a safe environment. I, th I heard a lot of my patrons say that one of the reasons why they loved coming to the library was just because it was just a place the children felt comfortable. They understood the environment. They understood where everything was they enjoyed. Um, awareness. I think awareness for people who do not have um, accessibility need members, uh, whether within their family or within their circle, need to be aware that this community exists and needs and needs help. Um, so I think awareness is one that we can reach to people who have, who are non-accessible need or non-special needs. And then obviously literacy development. Um, that's not the least, <laughs> I have it on the bottom, that is by far not the uh, least important. Um, it is obviously what we do. And I think that there is a lot of ways that we can help those who have literacy um, disabilities. Um, my brother always um, didn't enjoy reading because it was a struggle for him. And uh, I think that this is a huge area where we obviously can help. Okay, Joel, next slide. Thank you. Um, and then we have what it promotes. Obviously, it, pro it promotes inclusion. It promotes that community partnership we were talking about. It promotes innovation. Um, I, went to a P I went to the PLA conference last year, which was amazing in Nashville. And one of the things they talked about was with accessibility needs, either programming or tech development or what have you, that innovation is a huge benefit that not only can it help accessibility needs members, but it can help those without that need. Um, if you have computer systems that need a little bit extra help for those who need hearing aid or vision aid, that can help other members as well. You never know what it could do. Um, imagination obviously is a huge part because you're able to have our ch all children come and expand their own horizons. Learning. Free play and drop-in format and stuff I will talk a little bit about later, um, but, but this is a huge opportunity for children to be in control of their own education and their own imagination and learning. Um, okay, next slide. Thank you, Joel. So the different programming that I've come up with, whether it be through my own experience, through training, um, I discovered a variety of, of kind of broad top uh, broad areas of programming that is sensory that is empathy awareness basically specifically speaker series um, library squad which is something we did at the freeman library which i'll talk a little bit about later um, that targets primarily teen programming and then we have free play and stem discovery i i put those in a broad topic because they all involve a certain level of independent learning um, and again, I'll go further into that when we get there. All right, next slide. So the sensory program, I think, honestly, is one of the easiest and quickest ways to create a program on the spot. If you do not have a accessibility needs program or a um, just a special needs program, you can start a sensory program. And it's either it's for me, I chose through my patrons. Um, something that was smaller. I only have about eight to 12 people in the room, um, including the parents. I try to make it really small. I have it about once a month. I would love to expand it further, but this I actually started this about four months before COVID hit. <laughs> so 
Um, there's going to have to be changes, obviously. Um, but uh, and then it's 30 minutes of a story time, which on the left hand side, you can see my little schedule, which um, throughout research, I found that that really helps those who have Down syndrome, autism, sensory sensitivities. Um, and then I try to make my story times very um, I have elements in it. So have puppets, have a hand, hand gestures. I don't always do book, literal books. I try to make the story very three-dimensional. And those are for my children who have low hearing um, disabilities or they have low eyesight. And although I do not um, have any experience in ASL, I truly believe that that still will help them feel included, uh, participate in the story time. And I do hope that someday we can have more tools available for that. Um, but, and then we have at the end a 30 minute sensory play time, which allows the children to um, touch, feel, explore, learn. And in, that, and in that process, I allow the parents time to interact with each other. And I think that's an important part because it builds a community. It builds the connections that parents may or may not feel they have. Um, so uh, if you have any questions about my specific story time, I'd be happy to share it. It's amazing. They have such a good time. I, I already had a lot of kids coming back each time and parents were asking me. So I'm hoping that after everything <laughs> is lifted with COVID, I can kind of jump back in with no problem. Uh, okay, Joel, next slide. Empathy. Um, empathy is a new area where I'm really excited about and was one of the things Lisa discussed at the beginning. Um, I think that empathy is an important area for people who have accessibility needs and those that don't. And I think this is one of the times where I think it, um, inclusive programming could be at its best. Um, I do want to say that my sensory programming is actually exclusive and that a lot of people uh, have things to say against that and things to say for it. And that is totally fine. I just found that a lot of my parents were seeking something that targeted them and them alone. And so I did that for the patrons that I talked to. Um, but I do think there's an opportunity like empathy programming where you can have that inclusive programming and it be safe and it be comfortable for everybody. Um, and it teaches children with and without accessibility needs that kindness and empathy um, are great tools and they help you as a child understand difficult things that you'll have to face in your life in the future. Um, but a few examples of these are pen pal program, which you could collaborate with schools or not, um, and have children write to children in accessibility classrooms or um, just have a free for all. You can be as specific or non specific as you'd like with all of these that I give you. Um, and in terms of the budget, same thing. I have in my system branches that are very large and branches that are very small and each of these I tried to develop a way that you can make them as big as you'd want or as small as you'd want. Um, kits being one of the bigger things obviously that we can try to distribute to um, organizations and to schools. Um, but obviously the pen pal program is a collaboration effort or it doesn't have to be uh, within the and within the library. Blankets for others is an is an exciting one for me, and I really hope to start that once um, restrictions are, are uplifted from the branch. But uh, what we want to do is create these blankets, um, which I can go into detail, but uh, just because of time, I'm going to skip that. Uh, we create blankets in a really easy way, uh, and the children make these blankets, and that we talk about at the organization that we're going to donate them to, so that they know that the work that they're doing is going to be given to someone in need. Um, and I, I really am excited about that program. And we've already reached out to the, a homeless shelter in the area, a women's center, the, even the, a, a shelter, an animal shelter. All of these are great options. And then we have a tutoring program, which we can have those who um, are uh, non-accessibility needs, tutoring those with needs, um, or vice versa. I think that this is an opportunity for them to for accessibility needs children to interact with everybody in their community and know that they have a part to play. 
Um, so again, all of these are flexible uh, and they're exciting. And you can find a lot of libraries doing some of these programs throughout the country. And it's really exciting. Um, and if you have any questions about these, we can, we can delve into that at the end. Okay, next slide. And then our awareness series, uh, our awareness like speaker series um, is again, just to bring awareness to the different needs within the community, whether that be um, ASL, whether that be autism, Down syndrome, um, or, or mental, mental disabilities, anything that you can uh, provide for the general public. Um, and that can contribute to parental relationships. This is time for parents to come and interact with other members of the community. Uh, community discussion, what can we do within our own community? Um, virtual and in-house recordings. Obviously right now, this is a great opportunity for this. Um, it can provide an opportunity for you to have something in-house, but then also have something to look back to via YouTube or your website. Um, this can provide resources to the public. And then just various topics include testing, um, music therapy, mindfulness, um, physical activity, anything pretty simple, to be honest with you. Um, music therapy for my brother was huge. Um, and it's a very, uh, it's a huge concept that's kind of becoming really excited, exciting for a lot of people. So um, just different topics that you can discuss and the sky's the limit, it's really fun. Um, okay, next slide. And then our team programming. Um, and this is specifically for those for our teens. So anywhere from 12 to 18. Um, and it's important to note that in terms of autism, Down syndrome, um, sometimes you have to understand there's a flexible um, mental level and, and that is okay. So you wanna make sure that you have different, different avenues for, for people and for children. And the team program was a volunteer program where children above the age of 12, below the age of 18 could come and volunteer, whether that be shelving books, whether that be helping with programming, whether that be helping with celebrations. Um, it's, it's very exciting and they enjoy it so much. It fosters their skills to make sure that they have skills available for them when they leave high school, when they're gone, when they're adults. Um, fosters growth, it fosters relationships with, uh, with, it, with the teen community. Um, and it's really exciting. And I hope again to, to bring this back because it was um, one of my coworkers said it was a great program. And she goes, and I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> and, and, and unfortunately that happens a lot within libraries. I'm sure everyone here knows that sometimes you start programs and they're great and then just things happen. Prime example, COVID. You know, um, but that doesn't mean that these these can't be brought back. And I think that this is a great opportunity for those who are above the age of 12 who can't be forgotten. Um, okay, next slide. I'm trying to hurry now. I know we have time limit. Uh, and then we have uh, my final program, which is the Free Play Discovery STEM. And this is something, again, super flexible. Um, budget is super flexible. This is as much and as far as you want to go with it. But what the target is, is what you want to focus on is that it's self-directed learning, um, intergenerational play and diverse play, diverse relationships. It could be anywhere from eight to 16. It could be anywhere from three to eight. It could, you try to make the age group um, flexible and broad, and you try to make the diversity broad because you want relationships to build. You want a relaxed environment where you're just having a good time. You know, sometimes learning comes from enjoying yourself, especially with children. And I think sometimes we forget that. So I think free play and discovering STEM, you have that opportunity to let them just go and have a good time. Unstructured times, parental connections and communications. We want the parents to focus on themselves and let the, care, let the uh, children go. And we actually say that at the beginning. We say, you know, parents, try to limit your interaction with your child. If this is comfortable for you, please try to have your child mingle about themselves. And if they're by themselves for a little bit, that's okay. If they talk to other people, that's okay. Um, and again, it's also an opportunity to have those teen volunteers there. Um, and then all in all, it, it provides community growth and that's what we want. Um, uh, and then next slide, I think I have just a few more. Um, and these are just examples. 
So we have building, Legos, marble run, have just Legos and marble runs and building blocks out and let them go, let them have a good time. Uh, science and sensory units, so kinetic sand, planting seeds, sensory jars, circuits, anything that they can kind of explore on their own without some guidance. Um, I think that's the target. Um, and yes, I just saw Joel say interacting with others with other abilities is the target. Um, you're wanting to give them an opportunity to be independent. Um, but yes, there are the other ones there. And then we have our next slide, and I think I'm done after this. Um, so what's next for my system is we're trying to provide a minimum of one program per branch. Um, that's our minimum target. Um, we're trying to increase equipment, sensory items, and building accommodations, um, more uh, physical attributes. Um, we're trying to create more staff training or a staff liaison position. Um, I would love to be in that position at my branch. I think that's so exciting. And it's someone who just really... Um, their expertise is this area, and they try to make sure their branch is up to par. Um, expand services and resources for community and patrons. Um, and then five branches collaborate with nearby school districts to provide services. Um, and then we want to track uh, requests via HCPL main website, which I discussed earlier. We want that to be um, way better. Uh, and I think that that is a more tech-oriented uh, thing that we've, we've got to do. Um, okay, I am done and thank you so much for listening to me and my presentation. And again, at the end, if you have any questions, let me know. Hello everyone. My name is Caitlin Hodges. I'm with the Virginia Beach Public Library and I have two sections to my presentation. Um, but the first is utilizing the National Library Services Talking Books Program. Next slide, jo Joel. Alrighty, um, you're probably going to want to know what the National Library Service for the um, Blind and Print Disabled is. It's a division of the Library of Congress and it provides reading materials in alternate formats to network libraries to distribute to customers with qualifying print disabilities. Next slide, Joel. Um, you may want to know who qualifies. That's blind and low vision people, um, people who have a physical disability that makes it difficult to hold print materials or turn pages, as well as people with reading disabilities like dyslexia um, and all the conditions that kind of um, exemplify those condition, those um, qualifications are listed below. Next slide, Joel. Um, so institutions are also eligible eligible for service, but the main thing is they have to serve someone with a qualifying condition. This could include nursing homes, assisted livings, rehab centers, schools with special education classrooms, and library branches or school libraries. Next slide, please. Um, the materials provided to people who get the service are digital books and the digital player picture to the right, large print books, Braille and or twin vision books, um, book downloads via BARD, descriptive DVDs, and um, digital and or Braille magazines, and music materials. Those two are sent directly from NLS, whereas the others are sent by um, NLS network libraries. Next slide, please. So the way it works is to initiate service, um, anyone interested in needs to fill out an application, individual or institutional, whichever applies, with the signature of a certifying authority. Certifying authorities can be doctors, um, social workers, um, any other med medical professional like um, a nurse or um, a rehab counselor, any of those um, qualify to be a certifying authority, even librarians or teachers. So you could certify, any of y'all could certify. Um, then you'll need to send in the application to the regional or sub-regional or fill it out there. And then you'll be able to get books, um, pick them up from their libra your library, receive them through the mail, or download them through to a smart device using BARD. Um, if you choose to get books through the mail, um, the way it works is the books go free matter for the blind and you just flip over the label and it'll go postage free. Next slide, please. Um, to access material, you can call, email, or visit your regional library to discuss reading preferences, 
um, book titles, authors, or subjects. You can search and add books using your library's online catalog or download books from BARD. Next slide, please. Um, a little bit about BARD, it's available to all NLS patrons as an app for computer or mobile device, and it allows patrons to instantly download books or web braille to their device. The benefits are um, it is instant, instant access. You don't have to wait on the mail. You get a lot more selection than you would um, getting the books physically sent to you. Um, there's a ton more books available on BARD. You can keep the books as long as you have space on your device. And um, it's obviously more portable because you're taking your phone or your tablet with you anyway, so why not? And it works on um, mobile devices so that are produced by Apple, Android, or the Kindle Fire. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a slide with the interfaces on there, so if you want to get a look on it. Obviously, if you um, go back to the previous slide, Joel, you don't have to do it, but um, if you're looking at the recording and go back to the previous slide, slides, you'll see that it looks exactly like the player itself. Next slide, please. So what you can do to help spread the word, you can know who qualifies. One in 10 of everyone who comes into your library has a disability, and the chances are of them of having one that would qualify them for the service are pretty high. So you can mention, mention the service to the qualifying patron and ask if they're interested. You can certify them when you are comfortable. If not, have someone else at your library certify. You can give them your regional or sub-regional library's information, send in their application, and continue to advocate for the service. Um, if you just want to know like some tips on how to know if they would qualify, um, if they're constantly checking out large print books, if you notice they get really close to the book that they're reading, um, if they have a noticeable physical disability that affects their hands and their arms, um, if they ask for accommodations related to any of the um, conditions described, or if they just mention a disability in conversation. We all know people like to talk about um, themselves, their life. A lot of times it's just gonna come up naturally. So any of that, those are good ways to know if someone would qualify. Next slide, please. The second half of my presentation is pushing past reasonable accommodations, how to be more inclusive in a digital world. Since most of um, our libraries really are limiting physical services. I took that section out and decided to focus more on document accessibility, web accessibility, and operation system accessibility. So um, how you can be accessible with how things are right now. So next slide, please. So as far as document accessibility, um, if you're using Word, you'll need to use headings when organizing your document. Insert alt text um, for all images that convey content. You'll need to use high contrast and run built-in accessibility checkers. Um, similarly with PowerPoint, you would need to use pre-formatted templates. This is very important, similar to using headings because people using screen readers like JAWS, it helps them navigate through the document and make sure that it reads it correctly. Um, if you do your own um, template, a lot of times JAWS won't know what order to read. Um, insert alt text for all images, use high contrast colors, and run built-in accessibility checkers. Um, as an added little tip, um, I would suggest maybe avoiding using PDF unless you have Acrobat Pro because PDFs are not very accessible to screen readers. If you need to use a PDF, just create a Word version of that PDF so that people using screen readers can access it. Um, a lot of times with screen readers, they'll just, um, you'll click on the PDF and either it'll say something like document and then leave it at that, or it won't say anything at all. Um, several of my coworkers use screen readers and they have encountered a lot of difficulty with it. Next slide, please. A little more about alt text. Um, alt text is um, text a computer or screen reader reads in place of an element it cannot recognize like a picture or an image. It's crucial for accessibility purposes. Text should be concise and avoid being verbose, mindful of the context, 
um, descriptive and convey the meaning of the image and end with a period. It doesn't need a, a title because, or to say that it's a picture, an image, a screen reader will already pick that up. Next slide, please. Um, as far as operating system accessibility, most, if not all, operating systems have built in accessibility features. For Windows, you'll need to select ease of access and then you'll be able to use features like narrator, audio descriptor, magnifier, cursor and pointer size, and high contrast themes. These are completely free. So if you um, want to check all the accessibility boxes, this is a good way. However, if you have a lot of customers that come in needing um, a screen magnifier or a screen reader. Um, options like Zoom Text and JAWS are out there. They're um, programs that you'd need to purchase. But if there is a need, um, I'd highly suggest it. I'm a Zoom Text reader my, user myself um, because always, typically, the purchase products are always going to be a little bit better, provide a few more options than you would the free products. Um, it's also a good idea to have an accessible workstation that has these programs on them because a lot of the rehabilitation agencies throughout the country teach um, their consumers how to use them. But if you um, have budgetary constraints or if you don't see a need to justify, these are options. Next slide, please. Um, um, then there's Mac accessibility. Um, as a whole, Mac a lot of times offers a lot more than Microsoft as far as accessibility goes. It's just kind of a blanket statement. Um, so they offer features such as voice control, voice over text to speech, zoom and hover text and cursor and pointer size and dark mode and high contrast themes. That a lot of what the Macs offer is similar to what the accessibility settings that you'll get on your iPhone or iPad, which is pretty extensive, but obviously Macs are um, more expensive, higher price, so you got to think about that as well. Next slide, please. Um, as far as browser accessibility, they have built in accessibility features such as page zoom, keyboard shortcuts, text zoom, operating page, overriding page fonts, overriding page color. Um, these are all um, really good options um, that you can use when you're using Firefox. As when you see the next slide, you'll see that Firefox is also much more easier to access than Google Chrome. But next slide, please. Um, browser accessibility for Google Chrome, you're going to have to add a separate accessibility extension. Um, so you're going to have to go through an extensive number of steps. I'm not going to go through all of them um, just to make it possible for you to use the accessibility features. Next slide, please. Um, and once you've downloaded and got all that squared away, um, you can use carrot browsing, color enhancer, high contrast, and image alt, view, alt text viewer. So, um, and if you want to know, carrot browsing is actually where you can navigate using your keyboard rather than your mouse. So a lot of screen re um, people who use screen readers, that they know how to do that very well. Next slide, please. All right, um, if you're wanting to make your marketing or your website accessible, um, you'll want to follow the um, web content accessibility guidelines whenever possible. There's the link to learn more and to download it. And um, remember to use alt text whenever including pictures or images, um, even when other web accessibility factors are out of your control. Um, with my library, um, our website is usually hovering around 83% accessible. The reason is, is there are a lot of city control features such as banners, colors, things like that. Um, things beyond our webmasters um, control. But if you have um, the ability to edit your website, this these are good, good things to do. And if you're interested, just contact your webmaster and see if they're running these checkers see where y'all are at. Um, 
but um, whenever possible, even if there's some things you can't control, try to control what you can, make the font bold, make it big, um, make sure you're doing a good color contrast if allowed. Just simple things do make a big difference, even if you can't control absolutely everything. Next slide, please. So what you can do is you can run accessibility checkers on all documents, websites, resources, and catalogs. You can practice the use of built-in accessibility features. Um, so you're familiar with them if anyone asks, um, or if you, um, once the branch opens back, if you're, um, if they need help. Um, you can include an accessibility statement on all promotional impairments materials that's extremely important and you can refer refer your customers to other local NLS regional or sub-regional libraries. Um, a good a good resource I've found is the Project Enables websites. They have um, accessibility checklists um, and ASGLA um, which was a division of ALA had a lot of tip sheets for services with people with disabilities. Um, so those are fantastic resources. Um, and uh, as far as like just to like really zero in on the accessibility statement, it's extremely important. I've had personal experience with not somewhere not having an accessibility statement. When creating one, you definitely need to have who to contact and have a time frame of when to contact them. And the person that needs to accept um, the accommodation request really needs to know what they're doing, who to um, send those que those requests to, how to follow up on those requests so that everyone can be allowed equal participation in any program you have, anything you put out, um, on the web, anything like that. Accessibility, having an accessibility, an accommodation statement where people can submit accessibility requests is crucial because if it's not there, a lot of times people don't know who to contact. They don't know even if accommodations are going to be made from the get-go. So um, I just highly recommend that as well as sending customers to their local NLS regional or sub-regional to get services. Um, but that concludes my presentation. Um, if we have time for questions, take it away, Lisa. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kelsey and uh, Caitlin, for all of that. I'm going all the way back to the beginning. I know uh, the chat has been going throughout. Joel has been answering some of the questions, um, but I want to make sure to get these questions on the recording as well as the responses to them. So I'm going to start right at the very beginning. Um, and that would be the first question was, what are the kits in the empathy program? Um, Joel brought up, they are basically a backpack with a few tools to help the child like spinners, textures, and other manipulatives. Um, let's see, uh, Kelsey, do you have anything else to add in regards to the kits? Um, yeah, I, I will say, I will say that for different programs, um, it, it, I, I want to emphasize the fact that I know each branch and each library system is different, um, and that you, based on your budget, can do as much as or as little as you'd like. Um, obviously, the more the merrier, but um, we know that there are, there are limits. Um, so it could be as simple as something that you make with the materials you have at your branch. I mean, I know that we have so many crafts and we use we, we try to we try to use those, um, but um, or you uh, one of the things I want to try to get are noise canceling headphones, specifically even for my special stars class. Um, so um, they can vary, and that's just what I wanted to add because it, it's it's important to note that you don't have to feel like you need to go off, spend thousands of dollars on things. Um, the next question was, where do they, um, and I'm assuming these are, we're still talking about the kits, where do they go and are the books themed? Um, uh, let me, I'm trying to find that one because uh, where do they go? Oh, here it is. Well, where do they go? Are the books themed? Um, in terms of where do they go, I I'm assuming that that means just within the library itself. Uh, and we do, we keep them um, obviously in, in the branch. Um, we use them just for the specific programs. 
Um, so, and obviously during COVID and I'm assuming afterwards, we're going to make sure that they're sprayed. We do this with our toys anyway, with, with protective, healthy, um, sterile uh, materials that we use to clean our toys. So we do the same. Um, and we obviously don't have all of them for each child, but we try to accommodate um, per what the child might need. Some child just needs, uh, they may just need a heavy blanket or they may need a fidget spinner or they may need a toy, a stuffed animal for comfort. So it varies. Um, so we have them at the library and the books, um, I specifically try not to be so theme oriented in my programs, um, but sometimes I'll do a program in my special stars that is numbers or animals and I do do themed books. Um, but uh, in terms of the kits, no, usually we try to, we can we, we try to get as what books we can get um, from the system and from what we have at the branch. Um, so we being themed is really nice and exciting and fun and it can be done. But I try to limit themes because it just themes will just start to limit what you can provide, in my opinion. Um, and we have a yes to music therapy. Um, Aaron Groth from uh, Washington Talking Book and Braille Library mentioned that they have some, um, I'm assuming um, MT is music therapy students from the local university come and do a program for us uh, a few years ago. So that might be for those who are wanting to do some uh, programs um, or even some uh, staff uh, trainings, maybe reaching out to your local universities, um, anybody learning music therapy that, or any of these other ones might be a great uh, resource there. Uh, Joel oh. also mentioned. Uh, oh, just real, real uh, quick, yeah. I wanted to just say that, that uh, real quick, I want to say that's a prime example of uh, the community connections and partnerships. That's, that's awesome because you're using your resources within your own community. But exactly. That's exciting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and we don't always think about that. And I think that's what's so great right. about this, uh, doing these kind of workshops is, you know, starts everybody get to think about all those different resources. Um, Joel mentions the kits are more sensory stimulus centered. One might have, like you mentioned, soothing textured sounds um, or a weighted blanket. Um, let's see. Um, he also mentioned these kinds of, of programs are also equalizing. Kids are playing on a common ground, interacting with others uh, with other abilities. Um, so next question, how do you advertise these programs? Flyers, press releases, et cetera, while being sensitive, sensitive with wording? Um, that's a great question. Um, it, is, it is difficult. Um, my best advice would be to understand who are you, you are trying to connect with, with your program. If it's an empathy program, it might be inclusive where you're trying to reach those with and without accessibility needs. Um, and if you're doing one like My Special Stars, which was exclusive and I wanted to target those with, with accessibility needs and their parents, I specifically, physically, <laughs> um, would go up to the parents that I knew were comfortable talking with me, who I had a repertoire with, and I asked them, you know, what would you like? Do you need anything from us? Um, it can be as simple as that sometimes. Um, and then in a broader spectrum, again, those community partnerships. I literally researched in my community in Clear Lake, um, test autism testing centers, Down syndrome um, uh, facilities, like where, where the children will go to have therapy sessions, uh, the schools, different organizations that deal with, to interact with these community members. Um, so, and I advertise there via the flyers. We did the website, we did my social, the social media pages. Um, and then in terms of the sensitivity, going back to understanding who you're trying to connect to, if it's, a, if it's an inclusive uh, a program, um, you may not mention, you know, accessibility needs, um, but on the bottom, you might have uh, a, a blurb or an advertisement that lets people know that, for example, Harris County Public Library is accessibility friendly and, you know, tries to reach to their community or something along those lines where you, you want people to understand that they're included in this as well. Um, if you're specifically reaching out to those with accessibility needs, you use accessibility needs or special needs community 
Um, I know that I think the, in, at large, we're gravitating away from special needs and doing accessibility needs. Um, but a lot of families still recognize that same. So, you know, just, just know it's, it's more of just understanding who you're trying to reach out to. I hope that, I hope that helped. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I, I know with some of those, there's those the targeted, but also, re again, reaching out to those different communities um, and resources. Um, we have a question. It was answered in chat, but I'm going to read it anyways. This is going to in regards to uh, the National Library Service um, and our uh, qualifications and those who can certify, is it still the case uh, that people with dyslexia need a doctor's uh, signature uh, certification? And thank you, Erin, for answering that. Currently, yes, um, but we are hoping to get that changed very soon um, it, to where pretty much all public librarians, teacher, educators, um, basically everybody's going to be grouped into being um, all of the certifiers, a laundry list of certifiers for everybody else will also be able to certify those with reading disabilities. Um, as soon as that goes into 100% official um, you will hear this wash of joy and cheerment go across the entire United States, uh, <laughs> um, or at least all of us uh, working at uh, Libraries for the Blind and Print Disabled will be uh, cheering um, once that happens. Um, so hopefully we'll all be in contact with each other, letting you all know when that happens. Um, this could be for public libraries. This could be like your state rep. Uh, representative uh, may be one to push that information out if you're in connection or contact with uh, your state's library for the blind and print disabled, um, you know, definitely keep in contact with them as well. Um, so thank you, Erin, for uh, answering that question. Joel mentions investigate Windows accessibility features. There are magnifiers, screen readers, and many other ways for the machine to adapt to a person's needs. Um, another fun thing that I've realized is like the blue screen, you know, the blue light, you can actually reduce that as well. Invert colors um, just on on your actual screen itself. So um, there's a lot of different features um, on Windows. Um, Carrie brought up the ASGCLA Accessibility Toolkit. Uh, toolkits are now on the RUSA website, and she um, put that link in chat. So we'll try and get all of the chat um, links and things together to send out to everybody. Um, and uh, do you partner with the school's special education PTA? Uh, parents, uh, oh my goodness. It's not parents, it's teachers. I get those mixed up, I'm sorry. Um, so I'm not for sure if that's which one that would be because really either of you could be connecting with with those. So do either of you uh, partner with the school's uh, special education PTA? Um, uh, this is Kelsey and yes, I, I do. I specifically, I, I want to reach out to more schools. Unfortunately, right now I am only connected to two. Um, which sounds like a lot, but really there's so many schools. And of course, being, um, being a librarian, you of course want to reach everybody. But um, right now I work with two and I work with um, the, the head chair or the board um, of directors for, for the school special needs, uh, special education department. Um, and then specifically with the with the um, parents association and and I try to I think that the diversity in terms of interacting with different groups is so extensive when you really get into it <laughs> um, and and so it's it's difficult because you want to maintain all those relationships but sometimes you have to really search for like the head person and really build a strong connection to them because then they can give you more information. So it's really like leaning on each other and hoping hope and, and building that stronger relationship. But yes, I do I do work with um, I do work with the school education, uh, special education BTA and the, the 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 whole department as a whole. I think this is Joel. Um, may I 
also, also offer this advice to anybody who wants to cooperate with teachers. The state of Texas is divided into these regions and they have those uh, resources for some of the specializations. So um, your state may be different and may be organized differently, but we often are able to go to, for example, region four in our state to access some like uh, other tools and specialize and expertise in using some of these tools uh, for teaching children with special needs. So uh, don't forget that that's there and they often are willing to do a lot of partnerships, uh, especially like training people and training students how to use um, Zoom, what is that Zoom text or uh, some of the other uh, uh, magnifiers that are out there. It, um, it's great like how much the schools do offer as far as special ed goes, like Joel talked about training for a Zoom text, a lot of them do that. Um, we part, we haven't partnered, Virginia Beach, we haven't partnered with the PTA, but they actually have a whole special education division called CSEP, and we do partner with them, and they have their own um, teachers of the vision impaired, you know, accessibility specialists, all, ki all kinds of things to ensure that kids um, with special needs get what they need, so. We have a question, and this would be more on the public library end. Have you genrefied your children's areas to make it easier for independent browsing? And if anybody has who's in here and would like to answer that in chat or even unmute yourself and answer, um, but Kelsey, has your library done that? Uh, um, you know, we have. Um, we try to make sure that, um, I, I, honestly, I think it's a growing, growing process. Um, and for, for specifics, um, during COVID, we've really tried to build com uh, co committee groups to make sure that this is an opportunity for us to expand and build on some of the areas that we feel like we're lacking on. And honestly, this is one. Um, I think that we just need to make it uh, a little bit more accessible and easier for independent browsing. And specifically, uh, in terms of my programming ideas, it's the same for that too. We want to make sure that our programming is suitable for children to to learn and play on their own, whether or not they have accessibility needs or not. Because um, that's a lot of the that's a reason why a lot of parents tend to stay away. Um, if they do have children with accessibility needs. Um, so we want to make sure that the library is a place where children have the resources and tools they need to be independent learners, no matter what their, what their needs. Yeah, and also um, in order to justify that, that kind of thing, start thinking about it as being, this isn't just for a particular group, making something accessible makes it accessible for all. Um, right. One of the great um, examples that I remember being taught was um, putting in a ramp. So you have the steps, but then you also have a ramp. How many people who can walk up the steps actually find it much more easier, more comfortable to walk up a, a ramp compared to using the steps. You know, mm -hmm. the, that ramp is not just um, usable for those in wheelchairs, it's also uh, beneficial for those um, who don't have mobility issues. And a lot of this is the same, making something accessible really just, um, it's not just accessible for one group, it actually can make it accessible for a lot. Having large print, yes, universal design, thank you so much, Joel. Um, you know, large print, we're seeing uh, even those that don't have visual impairment, it can benefit um, as we're changing, um, being more screen reading, um, trying to manipulate how the screen is showing uh, to us. Um, can help with, you know, even our own eyesight, even for those of us who don't have a visual impairment. Um, so there are a lot of things that are really beneficial um, to more. And just think about that as you're trying to justify putting some of these into place. We're not just, you know, making this accessible to one group. You can see that some of us, we're just stressed out and 
even our younger kids who don't have other disabilities, it might be nice just to, you know, have a quiet time or quieter and less crowded story time. Um, Aaron Groth mentioned, I, I love using closed captions because they give me extra info all the time in movies and TV. Yes, my closed captions are on all the time. Um, and yeah, closed captions, there's actually a study out that closed captions are, um, you'll actually get potentially 80% of people um, prefer to have the closed captions on um, or have closed captions available. You're going to get a bigger audience if you have closed captions on your videos. Um, if you have any more questions about CSLP um, or um, anything regarding the inclusion committee, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and thank you all again. Uh, we were at max. Never have I ever had that um, personally. So this is amazing. Definitely um, an important discussion to have. Thank you all again and have a great rest of your week.